And let's just start at the top here. Um, Herman Goring, what interactions did you have with him and what were your impressions of the man? I know he was really bright, really to the edge of genius, if not a genius. Our, our psychiatrist said he was a genius. Show out of it. He spoke English. Every one of them spoke English, but not everyone spoke as well as, as Goring. Would you describe He's, him as fluent? Uh, yes, and very matter of fact, even his accent wasn't so great. But he, we were smart enough in the courtroom. He didn't let them know that he would. Of course, in the courtroom, you had earphones that had French, Russian, for, for the translation, German, yeah. and English on it. Yeah. And he would have his own most of the time, but he didn't need it because he could handle the English just as well. But, he, but anyhow, he was he, he was a tough dog to keep under the porch. He was going to take over, and him and I had a little problem the first day I met him. And, uh, what happened there? Field Marshal, my name is Art's name, mate, so I'm the commander of the guards here, and uh, I'll be here for a while, and I just want you to know that we're here to help you, do anything we can do to make it comfortable for you. If you have any problems, you can get a hold of me. And Danny's the 16-inch square. He's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, Goring. But Danny's over here going like this, because <laughs> he knew I was lying, but I was going to do the best I could, and I thought it was a good speech to make. So I get done making that, and I hadn't looked around much, and I start to leave and I hit Danny in the shoulder and said, okay, pal, take care, I'll see you after bed. He said, okay, and I turned around and said goodbye to Goring and there's a piece of yellow paper, no no bigger than this, no big deal, laying on the floor because they were allowed to have little pads of yellow pads about like this and a golf pencil where they couldn't hurt themselves, but they could make notes after the trial if they wanted. And this little piece of yellow paper was laying on the floor and just subconsciously, in the, if I had if I was a private in the Army and I had a piece of paper laying in my barracks where I slept, they'd try and say, get this place cleaned up. So subconsciously I said, uh, Field Marshal, you're going to have to clean up that paper there. And he snapped his heels and said, Field Marshals don't clean cells. And I thought, hmm, now I'm in over my head. So I said, okay, and I started to walk away and Danny said, you're going to let him get away with that? And I said, don't worry about it, Danny, I'll take care of it. I had no idea in the world what to do. So I go down the line, the next one was Hess and Donuts, and I'm going down the line and making the same stupid speech and talking to my guard a minute and leaving, everything was okay. And about halfway back up this side, by now it's got to be 6 or 6.30 in the morning, and I could smell coffee and breakfast and stuff being made underneath this, the cell block here for the prisoners. Underneath that cell block was an organization called Food Services, and they were Army. They weren't First Division, but they were Army. They supplies the food for the prisoners, and and they were I could smell this coffee. They were bringing it up. They were bringing it up into a, a circle almost as big as this dining room, and then bring it up there on carts and trays on the carts. And I had runners where I'd have 21 soldiers in here on guard, but I had three or four runners all the time in here in case a soldier needed to go to the bathroom or needed help with something, or if one of the prisoners had a problem to run and get me. I had runners in there, so the runners would come out to get that food. So when I smelled that coffee, I thought, uh-huh. I kept making the same speech, and I got up and Stryker was the last one coming up. He was the 21st. And I made that speech to him. Of course, he's an idiot. Then I walk out, and I get in there where the food is. And one of my guards, one of my runners was standing there. Two or three of my runners were standing there. One of them was a sergeant that had been in combat with me. Some of these boys were replacements that had come over. And I said, no food in cell number one. Now really cell number one was where we kept our clothes, but the first cell was Goring's. After that's what we called it cell one. I said, no food in cell number one. And I turned to walk away and one of my sergeants said, hey Lucky, that's Goring's cell. I said, yeah. He said, you know what you're doing? I said, no, but I'll figure it out. So I said, no food in cell one. He said, yes sir. So I left. And I go sit down and making up morning reports and doing the things that you have to do. One of the runners, same runner come over and he said, hey Lucky, he said, uh, Goring's raising hell. He's starting to talk loud and acting stupid about what's wrong with you and what, what's going to happen to you and how, who do you think you are. And I said, you'll be all right. And I left it going about another 20 or 30 minutes go by. He comes over again and he said, hey Lucky, they're getting ready to go up to the courtroom. And he's now speaking German and English loud where the other prisoners can hear him about what he's going to do to you and who the hell do you think you are? He'll get you straightened out. We'll be rid of you in no time at all. I said, oh, so I walk over. I said, I understand you have a problem with me. He said, 
yeah, I didn't get any breakfast. I didn't get any breakfast. And I said, if that paper doesn't get cleaned up, you're not going to get your lunch either. And I turned around and walked away. And he went ballistic. I heard him the whole way over to my cell. I heard him hollering things in German, so the rest of them would hear. So then he had strike one, I had strike two. I figured we're on an even keel. So of course he went up to the courtroom. And about 30 minutes later, General uh, Colonel Cal Benedict, who we played, who was an All-American football player for Army with Glenn Fionning about football in the days of Glenn Davis and those guys. And he and then he had been in combat with me when he was a captain. He I said, "What in the world did you do to Goring?" I said, "I didn't do anything, Cal." He said, well, he said you didn't feed him. I said, I didn't. He said, you, you can't go along with not feeding the prisoners. I said, never thought about that. No one told me. I don't see any orders on it. So I said, Cal, I, would you scold me if I had someone cleaning up their cell or to clean up their rooms in a barracks or something? He said, well, no. I said, well, do you think I'm going to ask my sergeant there? We won this war. you think I'm going to ask Danny to go in and clean that up? He said, no. I said, I'm not going to do it, Cal. That's, are you going to do it? He said, no. I said, well, we got a problem. And he kept thinking, well, he said, well, all right, you take care of things down here. I'll take care of things up here, but don't be getting me in trouble. I said, no, sir, I won't. So I left it go. Now they come down for lunch. And I waited a while, and I went over and he, before they, they served the lunch, I went over. And when they came down, I looked around and he, up, so he got as much, but uh, I won. I won. He won step one. I won step two. And from then on, we jockeyed for position a lot of times. But uh, the fact that I can, uh, oh. he, he exerted quite a dominant personality when he was under uh, examination. The first by, time uh, he was on the docket, mm -hmm. he was there for five hours, two days in a row, mm -hmm. and he really—I won't say embarrassed—but he really cut our Chief Justice Jackson down mm -hmm. to size. They asked him, and I, I would go up when he was on the dock, and I hated the courtroom because everything goes so slow and they take recesses, and I just didn't like to spend time there. But if Doric was on the dock and I went up, they would ask him a question, and he would, in his really, you know, I'm a big shot type way, he'd answer it with a question, and it would stop him cold. They'd, our, our commanding, or our Chief Justice Jackson would look at Lord Godfrey Lawrence, the Chief Justice from England, and they look at each other and they look at the Russian judge and he go like this. They call time out or recess or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, court will be adjourned for 15 minutes. Now, he did that at least two or three or four times. In addition to that, I'll show you a picture of how they sat in there. I would come in this door here to check on my guards when I wanted to and see if any of them need replaced or something. I'd have a replacement with me if they needed. Mm -hmm. And I would stand here and Goring and them were sitting like this. Goring said was right here, and the person was on the dock was right there, and the judges were right up in back of that. So I would be looking right over Goring's head when these questions would be answered. And one day, Donuts was on trial, and they were asking him a question should be answered yes or no. And he went, went like this to Goring, and Goring went, just that much. And I thought, uh-oh. So I stood around there a while. First thing you know, they asked him another question, it should have been a no, and he went like that. I thought, that little rascal, he, by the way, he was only five foot six inches tall, he weighed 265 pounds, mm -hmm. so he was a little this way, but... I know he lost quite a bit of weight but between when he was taken into custody and certainly before the, even before, the beginning of the trial, and then it's my understanding he lost weight even during the course of the trial. Oh yeah, because he, I'll, I'll tell you how that I happened. know he was addicted to morphine. It ended up, he was taken, no it wasn't morphine, I got it, uh, oxycodone or something like that. Uh, Anyhow, he had a box this long, this wide, and this thick, or this high. And the guys were carrying it in, and I said, wait a minute, I wanted to check their in. I looked at it, I said, what is that? And the German, the American doctor was there, and he said, those are pills. He said, give me that box. And he took them and left. He ended up later, that same day, told me that he had the people count. There was 30,000 pills in there, and Goring was taking 40 a day. And I said, well, he must have been loony. He said he was really on big time dope at one time. And this is still big time because of the number he's taken. I'm, I have it written down. Per, uh, something. But anyhow, that's what he was doing. And it took them seven months, him and the German doctor working together, to wean him off of these pills down to nothing. 
and he went down to about the time we hang him, he probably went from 265 pounds coming in to maybe even 190, 195, but at least no, no more than 200 pounds. So I said we did him a favor. <laughs> Because he's noticeably thinner in the films yeah. and photographs. Well, he could, when he put his pants on with suspenders, once he lost that weight, if you'd have pulled him out like this, you'd have thrown a basketball down in the front of it here. He was, he lost a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. um, pleasant interactions with Goring down in the cell block. Did you have a pleasant conversations with him? Yeah. What was he interested in? Well, first of all, I knew his wife because of him telling me about her, Emma. Mm -hmm and his daughter, Eddie, who I saw on a few occasions. And uh, all I had to do was soften him up if he was not right. I'd say, how's uh, little Eddie doing? And he would soften up and talk to me like a normal human being, like we're talking now. Mm -hmm. But then, the minute he thought anybody was listening, he was proud Gordon again about, you know, I ran the Third Reich and I can run this jail. I mean, just didn't say it in those words, but he was letting you know. And in the trial, a couple of things he did in the trial left them know that he believed when it was all over they were going to say, sorry for the inconvenience, it's all over and you all go home, but they'll realize what a great man I am. And he left that impression with me many times in a more quiet way. He wasn't showing off for me because we were just talking while I was giving my guard a break and I wanted to talk to him. And uh, he was a great actor. Uh, if he, he knew what you in most times, particularly in the courtroom, what they want him to do. And he played the part for a long time in the early part of the, of the trials where I'm proud of what I did for Germany. We brought them from no place to where they are. And this, and towards the end is it, well, some of those papers you said I signed, it, I, I don't remember that. I don't believe I would have signed some. He was down to where I'm not apologizing, but I'm not hey, Ralph Hitler anymore. I'm Hermann Goring. Mm -hmm. He was scared of Hitler and he wouldn't admit it to me. I said, when Hitler tells you to take 60,000 soldiers off the Western Front, and you tell me he didn't have them and you guys were dumb enough not to speak up. Were you scared of him? And he said, well, no. And I said, but you wouldn't tell him the truth. He said, listen, if you argued with Hitler, you disappeared. You, didn't, you weren't at the next meeting. Nobody ever heard from you again. So mm -hmm. you knew don't argue with Hitler, even though he's a maniac and many of his, many of his ideas are foolish. But... I wasn't going to tell him that, nor is anybody else. So if you want to call mm -hmm. fear, call it what you want. That's, mm -hmm. But he was, he could be sweet. He could, I, I would never let the same guard on his door more than once a month if I could keep, keep him spread out right, because mm -hmm. he could win you over. If you mm -hmm. allowed him to the first, you know, he'd be wanting you to maybe do something for him. And if you do, I'll see that you get something out of my clothes in there one of these days when I have a chance. And, he was, he said, I said that to him once, I, you know, I was getting braver talking to him. I said, I understand you were taking funny stuff for a while, and I went like this. And he said, what's that to you? And I said, nothing, but suppose I knew where to get some. I had no idea what I was talking about. He said, oh? His eyes lit all up. I said, well, I don't, I don't know that I could, but why? He said, he had a diamond, he had a diamond as big as my thumb. I don't know what it might have been worth, but he kept it over and he didn't wear it all the time. He had a wristwatch which was beautiful, which we gave to one of our lieutenants after the lieutenant got permission to take it after certain things. <laughs> and I thought, oh man, I'd like to have that diamond. I could buy my mother and dad a house or something. But anyhow, I, and I knew probably where to go because I knew which guys were doing dumb stuff. And uh, then I backed off and a couple of times later he said, did you ever find that stuff he told me about? I said, no, sir, I quit looking for it because I realized I made a mess out of you. He said, what are you talking about a mess out of me? And we, we had a little back and forth, but I ran, the, I ran that area down there, and I was proud to say that my guys knew that I ran it, or mm -hmm. he tried to, but he couldn't. Yeah. Okay, so obviously the biggest controversy about the <clears throat> war crimes trials uh, well, as far as Goering is concerned, anyway, is how in the world did he get a uh, cyanide capsule? So what's your best knowledge of that? One of four people got it for him. Mm -hmm. I would never say the name of any one of them, mm -hmm. because I don't know, but they're the only four that could have done it and got away with it because of the interactions. But you hear everybody tell you how he got it. You know, one of them, uh, some guys 
little German girlfriend gave him a capsule and hid it in a pen and she gave Goring the pen and that's baloney because he couldn't have a pen in there. We wouldn't let him have a pen in there. No, wouldn't it? And he was a guard. I was Goring's guard. Nobody was Goring's guard. It was whoever was on duty that day that was put on that cell was on it for two hours and off four. He made his trips that day till the 24 hours up. He was out of there. Wouldn't see him again for a month on that same door, maybe six weeks. Mm -hmm. So nobody would his guard. But you can read many articles or guys will tell you, oh, my, my nephew or my grandson or something. No, not my grandson. My grandfather told me he was, a, he was Goring's guard. And I say, yeah, because if he wants to be Goring's guard, what do I care, you know? But anyhow, it, uh, he just, I don't know how to explain it, but he could, he could get things out of you. I was, when I realized he was much wiser than I, and I never had the education, then I knew that I had to play hardball with him all the time. I had to pretend I'm going along with him long enough to get him to just soften a little bit and then cut him a little. And I just, we played that game so that mm -hmm. I wouldn't let him get to me. Yeah. So when the capsules came about, when he came into the prison, we took one out of his pocket. Mm -hmm. Now you know, as dumb as I was at 20 years old, I know that that was a setup. He thought, well, here's a bunch of young kids in here going to guard me. They got that capsule. They think that's all I got. Well, about five or six months later, one time when he was down showering, we had been told by the doctors that, uh, or I'm not sure, I think it was the doctors, that any temperature above body temperature would melt that capsule. Like he could put it in his mouth and whether he bit the glass and swallowed it or just held it in there, it would melt. And uh, so every time he'd go for a shower, no, I beg your pardon. Then we found a second capsule and didn't know where it came from. And we really scoured the cell, me included with officers and, I mean, commander of the prison and everybody. We scoured that cell and had all of our people in there. We found, in those days, commode seats were made out of wood. And under the front of the commode seat was a little place hollowed out, which you could do with your fingernail over time, probably about this wide and that long. Just enough where he could have, before he, and the commode's the only thing you couldn't see in the cell. I got pictures in there, I'll show you. Here's his bed with his head this way and he's facing that wall. Here's my guard looking through 16 inches here. Here's a little rickety table bigger than this, but real rickety, so he couldn't hear. There's a rickety chair. And then over here is a little sink, which you can see. The only thing you couldn't see in that whole cell was back here was the commode. Well, why you want to go in and watch him when he's on the commode? He's getting ready to take a shower. They remember he always went to the commode first. And that was just, I don't know why, but we went over and looked at the commode. And sure enough, we found that little track. So we figured that's number two. The third one, I wasn't there when it was found. They found the third one, and I can't tell you where it was, but it was apparently kept on his body and then again transferred to something other than that commode seat when he went for showers or something. But nobody ever told me enough that I can believe or know what that is. And then the fourth one, only one of four, only four people could have done it. I don't know who that would be, but he got a fourth and committed suicide less than two hours before he was going to be hung. So, mm -hmm. and one of my good guys on the, was on the door, and uh, he said all he did, they weren't allowed to put their hands under the covers. They had to sleep like this again, in case they had a hidden capsule or something. He said he was laying there like this, and I knew he wasn't asleep, but he was just laying there, looking at the wall, and he went like this and yawned. And he said, went like this and put his hands down, and I heard something go, I crack into the glass. I looked over and blood was running out of his lip. I hollered, ho, and the runners started, and they got doctors, and I was over there, ran over there. By the time we got there, the one doctor was there, and he said, it's Sinai. He killed himself. Or he's dead. And we said, yeah. He said, well, it was Sinai. And I said, how do you know? He said, because his features are greenish. And Sinai, I don't know this if it's right. He said, the cyanide, that stuff will make you, instead of being white or pale, you turn green. So I just said, oh, so, uh, and again, I wouldn't offer a judgment on who did it, but there's only four people that could have, three of them were Americans, so I hate to think it was one of them, but who knows.